Welcome to Self Hacked Radio, where cutting edge science meets cutting edge health. Hello, everybody. I am with Vince Giuliano. He has been blogging for seven years at anti-agingfirewalls.com, and he's been researching the anti-aging literature full-time for 10 years. He is the chief scientist at Vivace Associates, uh, where he consults on plant-based substances and how they can benefit health and wellness. He got, two, he got a PhD from Harvard University in applied physics and computer science, and actually, uh, it was one of the first PhDs in computer science, in what became known as computer science. And he's had a bunch of successful careers in technology. Now, you're 86 years old, and uh, I presume you're performing at a high level? Uh, I, I think given, so, yeah. Yeah, given your blog. But let's, say, let's just start with, you know, what are the top things you're doing right now? Uh, just give me a brief overview uh, well, of what you're doing to function well at an older age yeah um, a, a, as you grow older um, there are more and more systems which shut down or run out and I believe that aging is a program phenomenon mm -hmm. and that part of this program is designed to shut you down so everybody gets shut down by 122 or 123 okay. they get turned off terminated it kills you the pro same program of development and um, but yet, because they are programs, they are to some extent hackable. Right. So the challenge is finding a series of hacks, and you have to keep innovating because the program itself is quite quite inexorable. And time um, is yeah okay. And, and time is running out. So as time goes on, you have to do more and more things. Right now, my personal regimen. Uh, includes very careful attention to sleep and good sleep. Monitoring my sleep parameters, the REM sleep. I do this with a smartwatch. Mm. Monitoring uh, the deep sleep. Monitoring uh, the stresses that occur during the day. What are your levels of uh, REM sleep and, and deep sleep? Like what well, percentage of total sleep? Yeah. Uh, actually, they're very central to what they're supposed to be. It's about 25% REM sleep and 23% oh, nice. deep sleep. That's really good. Usually uh, that those numbers go down as you age, but it seems to be yeah. nice at, at uh, 23 well, and 25%. Yeah, melatonin helps. There's a number of things that help. Uh, not eating big late meals help. Not getting into big fights with my wife <laughs> it helps. Um, um, uh, diet helps, uh, and generally I exercise late. I, I generally treadmill for 45 minutes or do cardiovascular exercise uh, every day. I try and bring my heart rate up to 125, 135 in exercising. And uh, that somehow, coupled with the sleep, really helps control the inflammation that promotes SRT1, it promotes PGC1 alpha, and a number of other really good things. So the exercise uh, is an important part of it. Management of stress is terribly important, and that doesn't mean eliminating stress. Right. It, it means that actually taking on and incurring hormetic stresses. And you're familiar with hormesis yeah. and and the whole idea that a little bit of stress is good for you. So that um, uh, taking on intellectual challenges, going for long walks, um, uh, taking on physical maintenance of our summer home on Lake Winnipesaukee where there's a lot of giant, like for example, I was moving giant rocks two days ago. Mm -hmm. so, so taking on stresses, but also being aware that not being in a state of constitutional stress. So mm -hmm. monitoring the stress indicators, which is a, a hack that I could talk about that I've done. Right. Have you ever, by the way, have you ever had a period of long chronic stress in your life or it never, that was never a problem with you? Heavens to Betsy, yes. <laughs> where, I, where I've had 
very serious and debilitating things that would shut people down. I've had very serious bouts, bouts of rheumatoid arthritis and inflammation. At what age? It, it started at 55. Oh, wow. Okay. At 65, my rheumatologist said, you need, you must go on methotrexate. You need to go on, on uh, medication. At 75, he said, whatever you're doing, you can't expect it to control your inflammation. you you got a serious problem. Oh, wow. At 86, he says to me, whatever the hell you're doing, it's working. <laughs> and my suggestion is you keep doing it. And by the way, send me more information on it. Uh -huh. That's really interesting. So, um, so I've had serious routes of that. I've had serious uh, rotator cuff problems. I've had situations where I couldn't move my fingers. Um, uh, I, what, I, what ages were they? What was this at? Uh, they started in the late sixties, and through mm. the, some, there would be bouts of arthritis, and then I would adjust my regimen, adjust what I do, adjust my lifestyle. Did you have any problems before the age of fifty-five? Um, uh, only minor stuff. Minor stuff. Yeah, and uh, I am free right now of any. To my knowledge, right. To my not knowledge, I say that. You know, I'm free from dementias. I'm free from any diabetic complications. I'm free from complications. Um, I'm free from sarcopenia. Mm -hmm. um, I, I am free from all of the usual suspects of aging. Mm -hmm. How long I can keep it that way, I don't know, because it's a real battle. Because it's things. It's it's a little like whack a mole. Things start to pop up, and then you have to whack that mole and figure out <laughs> what better whacker I need than the whackers I have. That's interesting. Um, that's that's really interesting. What how, how how do you think your cognitive function has proceeded over the years? Like, can you give a timeline as to when you were at your peaks, when you were at your troughs? Well, this is going to sound crazy, but. Uh, I like crazy. I, yeah, I, I think okay. Um, uh, I have been writing, you know, as I said, even in earlier careers, I had three or four hundred publications, books, and oh wow, multimedia publications, lots of stuff. Forgot to add that in your intro. <laughs> I, I honestly think that my cognitive functioning now is as good as it's ever been. Oh wow! It's it's at its peak now. Even when you were at uh, getting your PhD from Harvard in applied physics and computer science, <laughs> yeah. At that time, I had to worry about getting enough good sex. I <laughs> I had to worry about um, uh, was I going to make a living. <laughs> I got to worry about I had the hots for young lab assistants. Um, I uh, had to. Uh, do all my work on a uh, an electric typewriter, you know, go kerchunk, 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 kerchunk. And uh, if I made a mistake in what I wrote, I would have to bring out correction paper, put it in the thing, and then correct the word so that the um, process of writing and the process of creating was very different than the process I have right now. Mm -hmm. With um, and I was one of the first to get into personal computers. I have one of the uh, early Osborne ones. I don't know if you know that. They were about the same date as the um, uh, the original Apple computers. And so I've been using technology or trying to leverage technology as much as I can at every mm -hmm. second along the way. Now, um what what sticks out about you amongst a whole bunch of other things <laughs> um, is the amount of supplements you take, which kind of sticks out about me as well. So I want to actually go through a couple, um, you know, sure. quite a few of them to see what your takes on. Maybe I'll I'll you know I'll give you some. I'll play devil's advocate a little a little why you wouldn't want to take them, and you tell me why you would want to take them despite that. Uh, so let's say mixed carotenes, right? Um, are, are you not – so there were studies on beta carotene in the 80s and 90s and things like that, early 2000s. Are you not concerned with taking antioxidants and, and, and uh, blocking your body's adaptive response? Okay. This, this is a very tricky question 
because there are hundreds and hundreds of supplements that are called and marketed as antioxidants, right. including vitamin C, um, including uh, many base substances that I take. Um, ginger, for example, right. something that everybody knows. Um, and the fact is that these are actually epigenetic acting substances. Mm -hmm. And they have a number of epigenetic actions that's quite independent of their antioxidant properties. And their antioxidant properties are secondary. And there's research that shows a pure antioxidant. A pure antioxidant. Okay, what's a pure antioxidant? A pure antioxidant is something that will remove rust from a penny. Right. Okay. It it works via chemical reduction. You know, you have oxidation or reduction. Right. It's a purely chemical process. But even vitamin C, which is reputed extensively to be an antioxidant, is actually an epigenetic activating mm -hmm. drug. And it's the epigenetic effects that produce the good stuff. So the fact that they're labeled antioxidant is secondary. And uh, I... So yeah, I, I hear that. So let's say, can you describe, let's say, what are the epigenetic effects of, let's say, mixed carotenes and vitamin C? That's going to be two different questions. Um, I I don't know that much about mixed carotenes. My my take on mixed carotenes is that there's a number of traditional vitamin substances mm -hmm. that have a long history from the 40s, 50s, and 60s of being something you don't want to have a scarcity of and that your need for these increase with age. So I just take mixed carotenes uh, out of that effect. I'm not an expert on mixed mm. carotenes. I've done most of my stuff on more exotic, um, less, less known substances. Why do you think the mixed carotenes don't show any benef benefits in like most of the clinical trials? Well, because I think they are what I said. They're, they're things where if you have a scarcity of them, you have a problem. You know, if you have a scarcity of vitamin C, you'll get very, very. Right. Um, uh, but um, they are not longevity treatments or hardly advanced guard things. So I haven't paid too much attention to the to to them. I paid some attention to vitamin C, but not a lot. Um, Same with vitamin C though. There's not really with two grams at least, uh, for general purposes, there's not uh, really hard clinical science or even after so many years. So um, Yeah, yeah you you're 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 uh, I I did mega supplementation with vitamin C and niacinamide in the 70s, mm -hmm. uh, back during the great days of mega dosing, right. or vitamin therapy, it was called. I gave them up. I don't. I, I think vitamin massive doses of vitamin C are extremely helpful if your body is in certain states. If, if you uh, uh, have taken a lot of a, a toxic metal mm -hmm. or if you um, have certain disease processes, they can be useful. But uh, I, I do two grams a day. I don't expect miracles from it. I don't. Um, uh, now, the, there is literature as to the epi epigenetic actions of vitamin C. I can't cite it for you right now. Mm -hmm. It's just not in my memory. All right, so we'll move on to different substances you're taking. What about, um, let's see, uh, NAC? You take that once a day? Um, actually, I haven't been doing NAC. Oh, you stopped that. Why? Yeah, I stopped NAC because, because NAC is a pure antioxidant, mostly. Mm -hmm. It tends to be uh, uh, mainly an antioxidant, a classical antioxidant. And there is research that says that um, when you take too much of a plain antioxidant, your endogenous, uh, your your natural body antioxidant mechanisms shut down. Right. Um, we are uh, a, a combination of um, 
incredible combination of control loops um, and system feedback loops. And so you take too much of an exogenous antioxidant, your natural antioxidants shut down. And there is literature that shows that uh, that's a, uh, um, a not a health producing, it's a negative health producing and that's, shortivity producing. That's process. interesting. So yeah, it's true that NAC has been found to suppress NERF2. But interestingly as well, it's actually been shown to be helpful for a lot of conditions as well. So, Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's interesting about NAC versus the other antioxidants. It's just um, it's got some beneficial effects that some yeah, of the other and, ones and, don't have. Yeah, it's, it's got some beneficial effects. And uh, I have uh, a bottle of NAC. And... Uh, if I feel that I've gotten into some sort of a super oxidative state, uh, I may take it. That's yeah, that's, that's a, wise, but not as a, a regular basis. So yeah, uh, I take it once in a while, um, mostly when I'm consuming fish, because uh, you know the sulfur groups are going to bind to mercury, things like that. So it's mostly for that reason, rather than. Um, but at some point, it did help me when I had a lot of oxidative stress. So. It, yeah. it is useful in certain circumstances, for sure. It, um, it is. Yeah. It is. It is useful. Again, um, the, there is sort of three different categories of supplementation and things you can do, and same applies to drugs. There is norm, maintaining normal, healthy homeostasis. That is, uh, your indicators of inflammation are low. Your kind of constitutive stress is low. You don't have anything particularly going on uh, that's negative, and this is what you do in that condition. Right. Then there's a condition where you've been in homeostasis, but something has gone screwy. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you get an inflammatory flare. All, all of a sudden, my little pinky, which I couldn't, by the way, when I was 55, arthritis, I couldn't do this. Mm-hmm. Could not do this. This would oh, go wow. click, click, click. Call trigger finger. Um, um, uh, it, what do if, you? By the way, what do you think uh, specifically helped you with that? There were a couple rounds of anti-inflammatory stuff. When I had my, this is a digression from your question, but let me talk about it. Um, when I was in my mid eighties, no mid. 60s, mid late 60s, I got a very bad inflammatory flare. I could hardly walk. I could hardly get up. My oh, wow. joints, my joints ached. Um, my I couldn't close my fingers. Any of them. Oh wow. Um, uh, I uh, could hardly function. And the same rheumatologist I told you about, who's a marvelous guy. Uh, put me on um, uh, prednisone, which is very powerful. Yeah. A very negative thing to do, very bad uh, effect on your body. But and um, what is what's the main negative effect that it's making you immune deficient? Pregnant. Yeah. Uh, oh, it it suppresses a number of hormones. It suppresses NRF two. It suppresses a lot of good mm. stuff. Okay. Yeah. So it's, continue. It's, it's an emergency treatment. Right that when you have an inflammatory flare. And he said, you're going to just need to be on methotrexate the rest of your life. You're going to need to be on this. This is too bad a case. And my reaction was sort of, put briefly, it was sort of, screw that. I, <laughs> I don't want that. I don't want to be on a poisonous drug. When the doctor told me that I was permanently stuck with arthritis. And um, if I wanted to control it, I had to be on anti-arthritic drugs. And then progressively, I would have to, as I grew older, I would need more and more powerful anti-arthritic drugs. I, in the mid-80s, um, prior to much internet, although I had it in my company, and I decided to read books about plant-based substances and arthritis. Mm -hmm. And I read every book I could read 
Um, and I might have read uh, 11 or 12 books. And I decided, based on that, that there were certain uh, substances that uh, had very powerful anti-arthritic actions and that I was going to start taking all of them in pill form, certain supplements. And uh, this was uh, curcumin was one of them. Uh, another one was boswellia, which is the same as frankincense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, ashwagandha, you know that? It's an Ayurvedic herb. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, an another one was ginger. So, and then I also heard that you needed to have plenty of potassium and uh, you needed to have um, uh, uh, enough B6. So I immediately started supplementing with all of those things. They had curcumin in the 80s, like pure curcumin? Uh, not, well, it, was, it comes in turmeric, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. In turmeric, okay, fine. Yeah. And um, I started doing that, and uh, I went off of the uh, prednisone doc, and then gradually, over a period of four months, the arthritis went away. Oh, wow. It just went away. It was gone. Okay. Nice. And so that's how I got into that. Now, the second chapter to that, which is that, I began noticing some inflammation in about two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. And now, advanced, now I'm 82. Okay. Or eight. <coughs> and um, I'm noticing that there's a little bit of twinge in this finger, a little bit of neck here and there. and. What am I going to do? I'm taking all these things. This is it's, when you were taking your full regimen here of like 50 supplements? Oh, yeah, yeah. The, reg the regimen that's on anti-aging firewalls, I was taking all that. Okay. And I, was, I was still getting this stuff. Okay. So uh, what I did then uh, is I was aware of the fact that by that time I had studied bioavailability and I knew that many of these supplements had really very, very, very low bioavailability uh, profiles. Mm -hmm. That curcumin was an incredibly powerful uh, substance in laboratory tests, but in vivo, uh, due to oral consumption, very little of it came through, and this was, um, I was aware that pharma was experimenting with uh, nano delivery of various kinds. Mm -hmm and that liposomal delivery could greatly enhance bioavailability. I, using initially very kitchen sink methods, began cooking up a liposomal mix of the same four herbs that I mentioned before. Uh -huh. Same ones. Okay. Different delivery mechanism. So you Much did this on your own? This is a uh, homebrew? This is a hack, yeah. Yeah, okay. I like it. <laughs> you, you, you call things hacks. That's a yeah. good term. All right? You got my attention. I'm listening. Yeah. How yeah. do you do... Is there, uh, is there like a quick and easy way to do it? Or it's a... Uh, yeah, you can go online and you can find YouTube videos on how to make liposomal vitamin C using a, um, a tool cleaner uh, ultrasound unit and a very powerful blender and some flasks and distilled water and lecithin. Now, we greatly improved that formulation. Mm -hmm. So I started taking the formulation, and my little vestiges of inflammation went away again. Oh, wow. Did you, did you uh, experiment with one at a time, or you just took all four of them as the liposomal? No, I, I, did, I was doing all four as pills. Mm -hmm. I, I did not experiment one at a time, no. Mm -hmm. I, I went for just a mix. And we've been improving the mix. My wife went on it, and many of her symptoms of autoimmune disease vanished. Oh, wow. Poof, they went away. Okay. And she, so she, she's had the best winter in the last 
25 years this last winter uh, and not suffering from the cold. I Yeah, I, I actually do very well on uh, long beta curcumin. That's kind of like a liposomal one. Yes, uh, yeah. It's a special formulation, yeah. So that's the only one I really recommend because that's what's getting absorbed. Yeah. So then uh, we kept improving this mix and we have more and more people on it. So about 15 people have been experimenting with it. Mm-hmm. And we're now in conversations with um, companies that manufacture supplements to make it into a commercial product. Mm-hmm. That's so, great. And um, you take this twice a day, and it's part of it's part of my control of the inflammation. What about so, uh, Boswellia? I think that's that's pretty well absorbed, no? And and ashwagandha? I mean, that has th- these have their own problems. That. The, the interesting thing about each of those four herbs is that they're Ayurvedic herbs. They have thousands of years of history in um, in uh, Indian medicine. What was the fourth one, by the way? Uh, ashwagandha, Boswellia, curcumin, and what else? Ginger. Ginger, okay. Ginger. Yeah. Um, and um, they have a lot of history, but they all have their limits on bioavailability. Mm-hmm. So... Um, we're in the process now of trying different liposomal concoctions. We we know that what we have is liposomal because it's been um, assessed using um, nano measurement techniques, particle size techniques. We know it's liposomal. Mm-hmm. It's not just an emulsion. We also know that the four substances for anti-inflammatory power. There's a um, a gal down in Florida, Atlantic University, I think, or one of the Florida universities called uh, Elizabeth Mazio, who um, uh, has had NIH grants for some time for evaluating the anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer properties, because anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer are almost the same. Two sides of the same coin. Yeah, so two sides of the same coin. Or maybe it's the same side of the same coin. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, we know that this mix uh, out of 1,450 substances she's tested, it's in the top 10 for its anti-inflammatory power. Nice. So we've had some uh, experimental validations, but this was, again, a hack that maybe turning into things. Now, will that be enough to control my inflammation forever? Well, I I couple it with a number of other things because inflammation isn't caused by one thing and there isn't just one thing. For example, um, your fish oil, your DEA and DHA are very, very important for control of inflammation. So you need what do you think about uh, fish oil versus eating fish? Is it supposedly um, there's different forms when you eat it in a whole fish, like it's in a triglyceride form and SN2 position? Are you? Uh, did you look into that ever? Um, I've not looked into that in detail, and I do try and eat a lot of fish. We, the di- in diet, um, uh, I try and keep meat down to two or three times a week. Okay. Now, you know, I love a good cheeseburger. Right. But uh, I try and keep the meat. I love corned beef sandwich. Do you keep dairy down as well? Um, I have made one major shift in dairy. Um, I still eat yogurt. Mm-hmm. And that shift was a shift to almond milk. Mm. So you stopped consuming milk? and. Yeah, I... I I, well, I've shifted to almond milk as my regular milk base. Mm-hmm. So I use it in my coffee. I use it in my oatmeal in the morning. Mm-hmm. And I've evolved um, so careful attention to diet. I mean, I there's a lot of things on my healthy food list. Nuts are wonderful things. I eat a lot of nuts. I eat a lot of blueberries. Do you try to go lower on the carbs, or that's not your thing? Um. Yes, however, I found that um, that there is a remodeling of the body mm-hmm. um, that takes place 
as you change your diet and you you crave carbs less you want carbs less and you naturally go to eat carbs less and um, so one of the things that happened uh, over the last two years was that uh, I went down in weight from an average of 175 to 180 hmm. to um, um, what I've regarded to be a sweet spot, which is 140 to 145. Oh, wow. And that's over the last how many years? Two years? I, I'm now down in that sweet spot range, which is which is actually was years and years of target range of dieting. It didn't come about as dieting. It hmm. came out as a a combination of all my interventions, and I can't say, I, you know, can I tell you exactly what is doing what? No. Right. Can um, I? I can. I'm. I'm just trying to manage the whole bundle. What about like gluten, uh, things like that? Do you um, do you consume gluten? Do you care about that or no? I, I'm. I'm not vigorously anti-gluten. Okay. But but I have. Uh, made a number of shifts away from gluten. Mm. For example, I used to uh, eat bran flakes and corn flakes, mm. which uh, for breakfast, and I've shifted to that from that to a steel ground oatmeal, mm. which has much less gluten. Well, oats obviously don't have wheat gluten in them. Right. So, so I, I paid moderate attention to controlling gluten, controlling dairy, but it's not religious. I'll still uh, eat yogurt. I'll still eat a plate of ice cream. Uh, I'll, uh, uh, I will How often do you eat ice cream? Well, basically, I have an exceedingly large family. Uh. Now, this means a very large number of birthdays. Yes, yes, yes. And with the birthdays comes cake and ice cream. And what I feel to be a sort of a social imperative to participate in that. Yeah. So I, I, might, have the same, I have the same issue. Yeah. So maybe once every couple of weeks, once every three or four mm. weeks, there's somebody's birthday party or somebody has a, a special dessert or, or somebody will serve me. A parfait with luscious-looking strawberries, but with a big globs of whipped cream on top of it. Right, right. What about? Let's go back to some of your supplements. What about uh, chelated copper, two and a half milligrams? You still take that? Yes, sir. You're not concerned of uh, too much copper because that has been associated with uh, various neurological diseases. Other diseases can cause oxidative stress. It it it, it definitely is. Um, it seems to me that the management of uh, of copper, zinc, and uh, the zinc and the copper are antagonistic to each other to some extent. Right. So taking having plenty of zinc is very important for a number of functions. Ha having magnesium is very important. Having calcium. So I take a, a CalMag zinc supplement plus separate zinc plus separate um, magnesium, plus separate calcium. Mm -hmm. Is it the optimum? I don't know. I, 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 I haven't done the blood tests or the, the tests that would measure that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, okay. So what about, let's say, something like calcium? You're not concerned? Uh, you're taking one gram twice daily? I'm, it's probably two grams twice daily. You take, so you're taking four grams of calcium a day? Well, you know, I don't know. I'm taking what's still in the anti-aging firewalls. Are you not afraid of, let's say, calcium depositing in the arteries? Uh, there have been some studies showing calcium uh, can increase the risk of heart disease, supplementary calcium. Um, yeah, if you take too much, I'm concerned about that. But I Yeah, but the studies that were done were shown on, like, even just one gram or something like that. Um, yeah. No, I haven't paid attention to those. Okay, and, I see. And, and am I managing these supplements optimally? I doubt it. 
Hmm. Uh, am I managing them adequately? I'm looking. I, you know, when a problem comes up, I'll tweak. Hmm. I see. But uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I, for my own use, I would be a little concerned about the copper and the the. I, I take 250 milligrams twice a day of calcium just to make sure I'm getting the recommended value. So maybe I'll have 500 milligrams elsewhere. Um, yep. just to prevent a deficiency, but the minimum effective dosage with calcium. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, you're probably a little younger than I am, and you probably have rope around the tires uh, to go, and your need for things may be less than mine. Hmm. So it isn't necessarily that you and I should optimally do the same thing. Right. I, I definitely hear that. Um, so yeah. let's see what else you got here. Uh, so you're taking selenium, 200 micrograms. You're taking um, COQ10. Do you think you've noticed any benefit from that? Um, you're taking 300 milligrams twice a day. That's um, yeah. That that's and and what I've done is switched since since what I've published to taking ubiquinol. Ah. Uh, okay which is a, a better form of COQ10. Mm -hmm. so, so some of the things, why am I taking COQ10? Yeah. Well, mitochondrial deficiency is very, very important. If the mitochondrial um, uh, chain of, um, of metabolic chain breaks down and you have excess production of ROS, uh, you have um, great negative action. The, the ROS leaks out, your mitochondria stop functioning, um, uh, or your mitochondria switch over, uh, or you switch over to a Warburg type metabolism. Your demands for SIRT1 on your body greatly increases and there's numerous loops that kick in which are negative bad stuff when you so, say srt1 it's uh you mean cert1 sirt1 yeah okay just making sure on the so, page so, so that uh, mitochondrial health is is one place where you want to have enough antioxidant activity and this is a little different than other antioxidants your anti, your mitochondrial antioxidant activity is very, very important. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, one of the things for that is melatonin. Mm -hmm. uh, another. Okay, now that you actually mentioned that, are you not concerned that um, melatonin is going to disrupt the natural signaling of the circadian rhythm? So, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I would if I took it in the morning, but uh, <laughs> it tends to have like um, a four-hour action half-life. Mm -hmm. um, so taking it when I go to bed at night, it's something I've been doing for years and years and years, and I'm mm -hmm. concerned about that. Probably the, the, the down side of that is that there's a certain hangover effect when you wake up in the morning. And do you notice that? Yes, I notice that. And and the way to work that off, that is a well-documented thing. I ran across a piece of literature about that recently, that uh, people can take up to three hours to work off their sleepiness and lack of functionality hang-up. What I do is, um, first of all, bright light, turn bathroom lights on as much as possible. If it's, if it's not rainy, and mm -hmm. outside, look out the window a lot. Do you block out? Um, do you block out blue light at night? Um, yeah. Well, how do you do that? Do you wear glasses or? Oh, do you mean do I block out screen light at night? Screen light and uh, artificial lighting, because that has been known to disrupt well, the circadian rhythm. Yeah, um, yes, no. Um, I certainly will use only uh, soft white or incandescent spectrum lamps. Hmm. In, in the house at night for light. So those, yeah, those produce less blue light than the fluorescent ones. Yeah. 
So there's certain sets of lights, like I have a, a blue light over there. Uh, I won't use that. I use uh, uh, th those lights. However, I allowed myself to use a computer or watch TV at night, mm. and that's blue light, and that I don't think that negatively impacts me very much. Although, You're saying subjectively, you, sub you haven't noticed any, any effect. Uh, su subjectively, I think it's okay, even though I've published articles about blue light and it's negative. The, one of my blog entries is on, mm. on blue light and it's, uh, it's evil. I've been a lot more careful of blue light at night. I mean, yeah, I completely block it out now. Whereas before, I was, I blocked it out, you know, 90%, but I wasn't that strict on it. Um, you know, I would have some stray lighting here and there, but I basically completely cut it out, and I, I think I think I have noticed uh, beneficial effects with that. Yeah, um, I I have noticed. Uh, I mentioned before we started to talk about monitoring my constitutional stress biomarkers. Mm. The the thing that most disturbs my constitutional stress, or the thing that most stresses me unduly is a three hour or greater disruption in circadian patterns. Mm. Um, trip to the west coast mm. really knocks things to hell. Trip to China, forget it. It's 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 a basket case for a week. So you basically <laughs> and it's a basket case for a week after I get back. Same with Moscow. Oh wow. Um, um, or the same for um, uh, the Middle East locations. Right. So basically, you, you to keep your circadian rhythm, you basically try to not eat so much at night, and you try to go to sleep at relatively the same time every night. Well, if if I go to the um, West Coast thing, and say I'm, um, I I can shift my circadian rhythm by an hour every day or two or three. Mm -hmm. So. If I shift my regular waking up time to 7.30 in the morning, okay, and then when I am on the West Coast, I may sleep in to 9.30, mm -hmm. that helps. I see. So uh, normally you wake up at about 7.30? No, normally now I'm waking up at 8.30 right now. 8.30 right now. Okay, and you go to sleep at what time? 10.30 or 11. Oh, so you get a nice amount of sleep. Yeah, I tried. I, it's important for me to get a nice amount of sleep. I've you wake up in the middle of the night? Yes. You do? I do. How many times? Um, once or twice. However, my, um, my watch gives me an indication of the number of times I move restlessly at night. Hmm. And that could typically be 20 or 30 times. Oh, uh, I see. Okay. I, I log all those things. I watch all those things. Uh-huh. Are you concerned about? Oh, do, do, so, do you wake up to go to the bathroom, or you just wake up because? I will wake up. I'll go to the bathroom. I'll throw off the cover. I'll change the fan. It oh, gets really hot, like really hot here last night. Uh huh. And can, and you and can you go back to sleep right away? Pretty fast, yeah. Pretty fast. And if I don't, I drop another melatonin. Are you uh, <laughs> right? Um, are you concerned about um, e uh, EMFs? Like, let's say, from your smartwatch or from other sources, cell phones? No, um, no, no. Uh, I, one of the professional societies I attend conferences of is the Stress Response Society, mm -hmm. which are the people who study hormesis, and they've studied EMF extensively. They've studied every spectrum of radiation from... X-rays, cosmic rays, down to uh, radio frequency, and it turns out, you know, the low doses of stuff's good for you. <laughs> but it's chronically though; it's not in bursts. I mean, you're you're getting a constant stream of EMFs. Uh, yeah, but from what? Uh, from you know, just in general, like uh, cell phone towers are beaming out cell phone signals. Yeah, we're not near a cell phone tower. We're not near power lines. Um, I'm probably getting a certain amount of EMS from um, the computer right over there, or a big mon, a great big mon. Well, what about Wi-Fi? Do you have Wi-Fi? Yeah. 
You do. So that's going to produce constant stream of EMFs? That's right. 802M EMF. Right. And so that's that's your constant stream, but you're not worried about that, I take it. So back to some other supplements that you're taking. What? Why are you, let's say, taking bitter melon? Um, bitter melon. Uh, well, went to Jamaica and um, uh, in a roadside restaurant, uh, a breakfast place, which is a culinary fast food place, they served a drink called mm. Saracy. And I said, what the hell is this? And uh, it turned out it was bitter melon. Then I researched bitter melon and I found that bitter melon is used in multiple, as a health um, food, health supplement in multiple different com- countries. I found that something like 15 or 25 different languages where uh, the substance had been independently discovered mm-hmm. and used for its health producing effects. So since um, uh, I have a um, daughter-in-law who's Jamaican, I said, what the hell, I'm going to add bitter melon to my regimen. Mm. So I did that. So it wasn't based on anything um, in the scientific literature as much? It's based definitely in the scientific literature. You'll find a blog. So I have a blog entry on bitter melon. I found very numerous, uh, especially anti-diabetic things and metabolic mm. benefits to and bitter what, melon. What are the, like, the, main, so, um, the main pathways or the main... Uh, you know the main biological areas that you're that you want to target. So let's say Nerf two is something. What else? Well, I'd say Nerf two and uh, nuclear factor kappa B, which is the inflammatory pathway, mm-hmm. are two key pathways which are like a teeter totter. Um, you promote one, it inhibits the other. You promote the other, it inhibits the other. They they move this way mm-hmm. and. So, doing as much activation as Nerf 2, Nerf 2, I think there's something like um, 150 uh, AREs, antioxidant response genes, they're called, which are health producing genes, detoxifying genes that have to do with Nerf 2. And also, when you promote Nerf 2, you inhibit the inflammatory pathways. Mm-hmm. So, I see these are the two most important. Now, what there, about something like CERT-1? CERT-1 CERT is extremely important. And um, uh, CERT-1 is important for DNA repair. So there, there's a whole new body of science that was not talked about two years ago, three years ago, or four years ago, but now is emerging of extreme importance. And that has to do with the gene regulatory effects of the non-coding RNAs. Mm-hmm. As you may know, there are numerous species that if you look at the DNA, only about four or five percent of it codes are the traditional genes right. that, for protein. The rest was called junk and we now know it mostly is regulatory mm-hmm. and that it exerts extremely profound regulatory uh, actions on gene activation. And what is key is that, and these are several species of non-coding RNAs, um, um, circular RNAs, um, long non-coding RNAs, uh, short uh, RNAs, hairpin RNAs, there's it's about eight different species. And what we know is that we can regulate the expression of those RNAs just like we can regulate the expression of genes with phytosubstances and with other things. So that this is the new direction. What are all those regulatory RNA pathways? Mm -hmm. How do you regulate them? And uh, we think that this is key to aging. That... uh, to the extent that aging is created by um, uh, DNA, which is not repaired or not repaired properly, etc. So, 
Cert One, I've written a number of blogs on Cert One and uh, a great deal about that and the NAD type pathways. And uh, uh, partly I'm supplementing now, not, not in my original treatise, on um, nicotinamide riboside and on... Um, mm -hmm. How uh, much of that do you take? I take that sometimes as well. I take, I think, two 250 capsules a day now. And, but I do that episodically. I can tell you why. Yeah. I also, also, I'm into a number of new exotic things that aren't in the thing, like Lapcho tea. Now, you know what Lapacho is? No. Lapacho is a, is a tree that grows in the Amazon. Hmm. And the, the bark of the tree, uh, and you, you, you just can't get this. You, in other words, you can't go out in the woods in New England and find a Lapacho tree. Uh, it's just the Amazon. So it's where a, do you buy it? You buy it online? Yes, there's some very exotic purveyors. Like one of them is called Amazon.com. All right. What, so, what's different about that than something? Well, the, the Lapacho, uh, one of the recent things we discovered was that if you want to promote cert one, you want to have plenty of NAD+. Plus. Right. Uh, you want to upgrade the NAD+. Plus. Well, partly you can take a supplement like NR to do that, but your body has homeostatic mechanisms that control the cycle of regeneration of NAD, and uh, I, it will it, it will tend to cancel out the effect of your supplementation. Right. So you need another tweak, you need another hack. And one of the hacks is that there's a gene called the NQ01 gene that determines the ratio of uh, NAD plus to NAD. It works mm -hmm. in what is called this internal cycle. It's called the salvage cycle, the NAD salvage cycle. I've written up, it's all written up in my okay. nauseam. You can't follow it unless you're a molecular biologist. I mean, it's, all right. it's so much so hard to do. But, but uh, so if you promote the NAD, uh, the NQ01 gene, that shifts the scale and changes the dial of the ratio and you get somewhat more NAD+, plus, which is the form of NAD you want, compared to the reduced NAD, which is called NADH. Well, how do you promote NAD? How do you promote the NQ01 gene? It turns out that there is a substance Research establishes you can do this called beta lapachon. There's research ah. cases. Oh, I've heard of that chemical. Yeah, I haven't. Uh, yeah, okay. I actually know what you're talking about. Okay. So, yeah. never so, taken it though. So, what you do where I was three months ago is saying, okay, where the hell can I get beta lapachon? And it turns out that there are some chemical supply companies that will provide you with beta lapachon for. Seven hundred dollars for right, like Sigma Aldrich or something. Pardon? Sigma Aldrich. Yeah, Sigma Aldrich. Uh, you can yeah. get a at absolutely undue, unreasonable prices. Right. However, if you look a little deeper around, where does the word lapachon come from? Well, it came from the fact that beta lapachon is found in the bark of the Lapacho tree. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it turns out you read the literature and you find out that beta lapachone is one of the major components of the substances of the bark of the beta lapachone tree. Mm -hmm. And I can get a six pack of what claims to be genuine Amazonian Lapacho tea for twelve ninety nine from nice. I'm going to I'm going to amazon.com. I'm going to get some of that stuff. You can also get a, a great big bag which is just shredded tree bark. Nice. From amazon.com. So and you take it in pill form or you take like the you just in like a powder form? Tea. Oh, oh you put it in your tea. Okay, fine. This is beta lactone tea. Uh-huh. And And do you notice any beneficial effects from it or it's just based on the research? Well, it's a combination of two. I have these constitutional stress indicators, and in that when I take a um, 
a NAD plus activator like nicotinamide riboside or um, uh, NAD via a um, IV, which I've had. I, that stuff is wicked expensive, but I was fortunate enough to be part of a trial through again, being being known in the longevity circles is great because you get to know the researchers who are doing this stuff. Right. And they will give you stuff that you can't buy and that you can't find and you can just try it out. Okay. So I've done that and uh, so I uh, what is okay, yeah? So what so, is so great about um, I know I actually I do know that NAD plus you want to have more of that. That's it's really important. So the cert one, it's activating cert one. Partly it's this action on activating cert one. You you do you produce more cert one. It when improves you the mitochondria. Well, it's 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 a double whammy. It's it affects the mitochondria. It affects many systems, but the main ones that it affects are the mitochondria. And the uh, and the DNA repair. If you mm. you're the biggest hog of cert one are your sort of parps, polyribose something or the other. Right. Big long technical name. Uh, they eat up huge amounts of cert one. So uh, if if the parps and they have the first dibs, the DNA repair has higher dibs on your cert one than your mitochondria does. Mm. So if your mitochondria doesn't get enough CERT1, uh, they're not going to produce enough internal um, CERT3, which is an internally mitochondrial antioxidant produced inside the antioxidant. Your mitochondria get leaky, you begin to get the Warburg effect, you get a range of oxidative stress and inflammation and you're off into Never Never Land. You've, the main thing is to not go to Never Never Land. And if you do go to Never Never Land, get back as fast as you can. Right. Which other supplements, by the way, do you do? You, uh, that's part of your regimen that increases NAD plus. Well, the, the the main ones that increase NAD plus are the um, are the right now are the NR. And the um, lapichon, and, and the lapichon, the um, SIRT1 is driven by a, a number of different conditions. You want to control your inflammation because your inflammation is going to eat up your CERT1, and then you're going to be in trouble. So what you want to do is avoid super inflammation. You want to avoid the Warburg effect in the, in the mitochondria and in the cells. And that's very, very linked to mental health, dementias, if you don't have that. Like, I think probably one of the major causes of dementias is uh, inflammatory in the central nervous system, inflammation mm -hmm. in the central nervous system. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. But um, yeah. that's, it's not enough. You have to supplement. You need to exercise. You need to pay attention to your sleep. You have to manage your stress. Okay. Uh-huh. And then... You manage your lifestyle, uh, other factors of your lifestyle. What do you do to manage your stress? Um, well, I just published a long blog, uh, which has uh, something like 140 reputable research citations that one of the best things to manage stress is meditation. So you meditate? No, I don't meditate, but I'm going to start it. Uh-huh. I don't. I mean, I've always regarded meditation as new age, airy fairy. You know, I'm a scientist. I'm not a. I'm, I'm, I'm not a follower of the yogis and uh, esoteric religions. But read that blog, that last mm. one on meditation. The evidence is there. It works, and it's a great managed stress. The other thing managed stress is sleep, and. Uh, making sure of the REM sleep and the other sleep. And the reason why I sleep nine hours instead of eight hours is that I want to make sure that I have enough sleep to get enough of those components. Now, you might be able to get by in seven hours. I, 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 like, I prefer eight, usually. Yeah. Um, but uh, I found that adding the extra hour gives me a cushion for times when I'm awake or 
uh, times when I'm not sleeping. So, so the supplements are important. How have you re- uh, reduced your stress before you got in? Now that you're not doing meditation, so like in the past five years, how have you been trying to reduce your stress? Um. Well, the biggest source of stress, <laughs> the, the largest sources of stress that people exhibit are social stresses. Right. Either fights with their wife, um, uh, caregiver stress is a very, very highly documented form of stress where people who um, uh, take care of elderly parents or who have major caregiver roles and um, uh, you know one of the best indicators of undue constitutive stress is short telomeres mm-hmm. and I heard um, Elizabeth Blackburn speak on telomeres I, I do not believe do not believe that taking exogenous supplements is going to lengthen your telomeres mm-hmm. uh, I do believe that telomeres are highly dynamic. They can get longer and shorter, and that stress makes them shorter. And Elizabeth Blackburn showed some unpublished data from a Kaiser Permanente study that blew my mind, which was that um, high degree of stress plus short telomeres is a 100% predictor of mortality within five years. Oh wow! A hundred percent is a lot. You don't get that's quite a bit. You can't get more than that. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a very very high prediction. Oh my gosh! Wow. So so that um, so that what's the mechanism there? That what are the top? I mean, I've written a post about it. I'm going to write a few more about it. But in your opinion, what is the main mechanism by which stress is so bad? Where 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 would you put the emphasis on like the mechanisms of why it's so bad? I don't know what the main mechanism is. I can say that um, in terms of cardiovascular events, uh, it the stress definitely drives up your heart rate and drives down your heart rate variability. Mm. And heart rate variability is a very classical measure of stress. It's a very classical measurement of stress. So. Occasionally, I will measure my HRV, but I do th- this other measurement I talked to you about before this interview of heart rate using the smartwatch. Um, mm-hmm. And what, what have you fi- found increased your heart rate variability? Um, lowering constitutive stress. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. It's all the things of um, a regular lifestyle, uh, not experiencing social stress. Um, Good sex helps. Um, having tremendously good social relationships, a large extended family helps. Um, you found that helped you in particular with your smartwatch? You noticed? Yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've had four wives, and, and during most of the years, we've all been very, very good friends and very, very harmonious. And... My wife and one ex-wife lives with me now, so I have a lot of relationships, and they're younger. Oh, wow. <laughs> Getting a relationship with younger women is How old gr- are they? Uh, they're 17 years younger than I. Oh, nice. <laughs> but now they're old, but they weren't old. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? what are, what, do you have any... Um, I'm, I'm in the market right now. <laughs> any yeah. uh, tips for me to uh, watch out for when choosing a mate? Uh, yeah, it, it, if you find yourself getting in fights with somebody, don't marry them, because uh, the idea that we're only getting in fights because we're not married and we're stressed because we're not married is complete bullshit. <laughs> uh, the unless you can, if you form a relationship with somebody and find that. That can go long term without stress, and then that's not going to stress you in your marriage. Nice. And w- any other tips? Like but uh, so yeah. stressed right now, and they have all these reasons why they're stressed. You know, you not marrying them being one of them. Uh, don't buy that. <laughs> 
is uh, that that's a really good one. I I like that. Do you have any other tips? I mean, the, you know, I, the reason I ask I'm asking you is because, like you said, you went through four marriages, and um, yeah. you know, you're you're 86, and you're obviously very intelligent. I'm sure you learned a lot of lessons there. Uh, yeah, I did. Which is um, be generous, be generous. just be really generous, and. Um, be very careful about making people wrong. When you make people wrong, they get defensive, and that creates a problem. And just realize that there's a tremendous diversity of views and ways of coming at things and behaviors and personality types. Were you the one who did some work on the um, Meyer Briggs? You had I some Meyer do, Briggs. I didn't do any work on it, but I, uh, I I actually posted a little bit on my blog in my About Me. Yeah, a certain personality type. Uh, what um, I have studied personality um, theory from the original Jungian. So, what are you? You're an intuitive. Um, I'm an INTJ. Which is the intuitive, and what's the N? N is um, so, no I is um, introverted. Yeah. Uh, N is intuitive, and um, T is a thinker instead of a feeler. Um, and then J is a judger instead of a perceiver. Okay. All right. I am in um, my functions. I'll name the functions because I don't know them in the Meyer Briggs terminology, but my, I'm primarily a thinker, okay. secondarily, intuition, mm -hmm. and I'm an introvert. Mm -hmm. I mean, I seem like we don't seem like any of us each other, but I, that's what I am. All right. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, I tend to be less of a um, of, of a judgmental type. Mm -hmm. I, I'm more of a um, of a what is is type. You know, more more uh -huh. to. So you, that's interesting because I'd say I'm I'm you know maybe naturally I'm a judger, but I've worked on that a lot, and um, I think it only comes out in certain situations. More of only when. I don't really know somebody or I don't, you know, I'm unfamiliar with the situation and I'm constantly making judgments, but I'm not, um, but, but I'm also very accepting and non-judgmental. Right. Yeah. Because I've adopted a, like a lot of Buddhist principles and non-judging is one of the main ones. So I've been yeah, working on that. That's great. That's great. Now, I, I don't know if in your theory, there's actually a wheel where these are laid out on two axes whether in Myers-Briggs. But in my, uh, if you go on my site, vincegiuliano.com, you'll find a treatise on personality types that I wrote some years ago. Oh, nice. Um, and um, y usually if you marry or mate with somebody who's adjacent to you, at least in some functions, you don't want somebody who's just like you, and you don't want somebody who's the opposite. Right. But but somebody who shares some functions. That's another tip. Um, Interesting. I mean, uh, for my personality type, INTJ, it's supposedly that they get along with the ENFP and the ENTP. Yeah. Um, and those are very different personalities. But it's funny because um, the last two girls I was into, one of them currently into, <laughs> um, uh, it, we're uh, ENFPs, basically. Um, and one was borderline, one was ENTP, borderline ENFP, and one was ENFP. So, yeah, I'm actually going, um, I mean, yeah, so, um, what I, it, that's really interesting. But because it just happens to be they're very different, but I kind of appreciate the differences as well. Yeah. Um, well, I, I study this stuff from people who studied uh, with disciples of Jung, in an independent school of the Meyer Briggs school. So it's more or less the same thing, but all the terminology is different and the ways of looking at things are different. But this has been a very powerful guide for me in my life. That's really interesting uh, because, you know, if you try to look at the sciences, you know, Wikipedia will say something like, well, there isn't that much cl hard clinical science validating this. But in my personal subjective experience, it seems to be very accurate in grouping what my personality is like and uh, perhaps grouping the people who I get along with. So, so anyway, yeah, I think uh, I think it's really important that 
like you said, you in order to reduce your stress, in order to live a good life, a healthy life, having healthy relationships is critical. And people don't emphasize that so much. I'm curious what you think of my own strategy. Like right now, I'm 28, relatively young. Um, I feel like my health is in order. My income is in order. Uh, just my mental shit is, I feel, is together enough so that, you know, I, I feel pretty balanced. And, um, you know, I know what I want out of life. So now I'm kind of in the, the dating world where I'm like, okay, uh, last thing, you know, find a girl who I really get along with and we click and we could have, you know, a successful relationship with. So, um, yeah, I'm curious. Uh, so I'm trying to ha- self hack that right now. <laughs> um, I'm curious what you think of my strategy. Well, it, it, it sounds absolutely great. I think you've also, in picking this whole topic of um, health and longevity, uh, you've picked a very, very exciting topic, which is central to this story in time. Um, uh, you, you've picked a, a topic of tremendous intellectual challenge, which... Uh, you can continue to learn about and you can continue to contribute. So I think that you've jumped into the main, a mainstream advanced area of science and knowledge and that can really keep you going and that can be very exciting for you. Uh, now, how do you make your living? Uh, I, I make it through consulting, through affiliate sales in the blog, um, through a few other means, but those are basically the main ones. And, uh, yeah, I, I help people with their health. So, okay. um, basically, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, yeah, I'm pretty stable with my income now and I feel like my health is in order and my cognitive function is in order so that if it, even if my blog did go down, I feel like I have the capacities to, you know, make a good living. Um, and so, yeah, but I'm curious what you think of my dating strategy. So, the way people generally go about dating is they kind of try to hide things about them. You know, they, they're pretty, uh, they're very private. They don't want the other person to know. They're trying to win the other person over, right? Yeah. I actually take the opposite approach where <laughs> I basically try to scare somebody away, tell them everything that I think they won't like about me, <laughs> and uh, all my negative traits, just anything I could throw at them, like anything that they think is weird. I wear red glasses at night. I do all these things. I have all my health, my previous health problems on my blog. It's like everything's public, and my strategy is is that if you just if you're your true self, then you're going to attract the people who like that true self, and those are the people you're really going to get along with. So, I mean, it just so happened. It, it's very interesting, and I've never expected it, but um, I've actually kind of got into uh, kind of relationships with. Um, or you know, romantic interests with three different girls that found me through my blog. I think that's a great strategy, and I think it's a great strategy of being completely authentic, yeah. um, of being yourself. Um, I, I think also what might help, or what helps me in my life, or numerous times, is that whenever I've did something, I've concentrated on just thinking about and identifying what am I looking for? What If I'm looking for a girl, what am I looking for? What are the most important characteristics? Mm. And then being open to what comes along because sometimes what you, you get what you want in a surprising way that you never thought you were ever going to get it. And it just comes to you. That's great. I have, I've actually done that. I've made like, uh, I thought a lot about it. Like I made a whole list of what I want and then through meeting people, you kind of, and you get experience, you're like, well, this wasn't that important, but this is, I forgot about this one. This is really important. So over time, you know what you need. Um, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and that if you get good at it enough, um, uh, what you're looking for will come to you out of the blue, not through, not necessarily through any conscious efforts on your own part or through through the circuitous channels that you didn't plan. Um, uh, I think planning is is weak. Um, it's funny. I actually have a, I made a blog post of like, you know, eight reasons why you shouldn't be planning because uh, 
you know, people like me are very huge planners, and there's a lot of downsides to that. Yeah. Um, um, okay. Um, I have a view of the universe, and I can't get into the details of it now, but um, you're familiar with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and the idea of complementary variables? Yeah. Oh, you know, the position of momentum are complementary. If you know one exactly, uh, you can know nothing about the other one? Yeah. Okay. I think the properties you are looking for in a mate or the properties that you want to achieve and the way of getting those properties are complementary variables. And in other words, um, if, if you completely specify the path, you will know very little about the particle itself. If you completely mm. specify the particle, you will know nothing about the path. Um, and um, this has to do with a, a whole theory of knowledge I've developed. I can't get into just uh, tips on that. Getting back to the longevity thing, it... It's a multifaceted approach, and I think that it's a question of constant innovation, um, constant experimentation, and determining we're, we're each so unique that this is not going to be a one-size-fits-all. And also, I don't think there will be any single key breakthrough uh, of a pill or any supplement or any one substance that is going to solve everything. How, and, many, how many years do you think we can extend uh, our lifespan based on current technology? Um, based on current technology and what we know, I think we can rectangularize the curve. That is, have more and more people live longer and better and healthier lives towards the limit which is 123 years. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we can continue to rectangularize that curve and have more and more people live longer and longer and healthier and healthier. And that is happening in society anyway. We're evolving. You know that right now, uh, every year that passes, the average lifespan from birth increases three or four months. Right. Do you think that will keep continuing? I think it will keep continuing. Now, what is it going to take to break through? Um, I, I think to break through the 123 years, you're dealing with a basic design. It's a basic design issue of how we're designed, and it's going to take radical interventions beyond any we've really discussed right now. Up mm -hmm. to, and nothing being discussed in the longevity uh, literature. Um, will do that. Um, not a believer in, you know, we're all going to become cyber beings or that we'll be uh, encapsulated into robots or computers or that um, we will become non-biological. But um, we, we are designed basically to survive very well as a species, not as individuals. Right. So... Um, now, do I think that um, several hundred years are possible? Yeah, I think there's some hacks out there that can probably do that, but I don't mm -hmm. think they are now. I'm, my own strategy is to keep going on hacking what gets me to uh, 105 or 115 productively, and then, um, and you have a lot longer to do this. Right. So. You have a, uh, you would say you have a better a priori shot at it, but I feel very confident that um, that I'm going to make it to several hundred. Nice. Uh, <laughs> I like but the I optimism. Can't, I can't tell you how. Right. I can't tell you how. I like the optimism. Um, so anyway, where can people find you? This has been a very interesting interview, and it went to places I didn't think it was going to go, like relationships, but quite interesting. So where, where can people find you? You can find my writing site 
at vincegiuliano.com, G-I-U-L-I-N-O. Um, my blog, which is um, eight years of over 500 articles on science topics on having to do life and longevity, is at uh, agingsciences.com, hmm. which is just points to anti-agingfirewalls.com. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my email is v-e-g-i-u-l-i-n-o at gmail.com. And I live in the suburbs, the Boston suburbs. Nice. And do uh, you have any products that you, uh, besides, I mean, you spoke about the liposomals that you're going to get out there. Any it, services you offer? It's, uh, yes, I do consulting services occasionally i will uh there'll be some really rich guy who wants to pay me a lot of money for a session on what it takes a little long time or um i do not do obvious health consulting because i'm not a health professional and i'm not you know authorized by the system as a as a, as a health professional but i also do consulting um, uh, it can be for pharma companies it can be for supplement manufacturers it can be for HMOs uh, various people on uh, obviously there's a lot of people there's a lot of organizations like an HMO or insurance companies who have a big vested interest in having their population live longer and healthier hmm. okay that's fascinating thank you so much for your time and uh, have a wonderful day. Okay, thank you. Take care. Take care.